this evening, I have the pleasure of being joined by Duncan and Peter Lloyd from Coriol uh, in the wonderful McLaren Vale. Beautiful winery, beautiful wines, but I think it's only fitting um, that I address a comment that was made uh, about 20 seconds ago um, that I've, I've performed a bit of a miracle here getting Duncan and Peter in the same place. Apparently, you siblings, you don't, you don't get along very well. Um, what's going on there? Look, we prefer not to talk about it. It's exceptionally awkward and, you know, <laughs> yeah, when, the, you know when you're trying to be out there selling wine, it's all about the story and the family. The fact that Duncan and I just, you know, can't get on is just, you know, it's a bit of a barrier. So, you know, that's, that's just life. Yeah, makes makes staff meetings, um, yeah. Really awkward. Awkward <laughs> uh, for everyone else. But, look, you know, we, we get through it and everyone just has to put up with it. Yeah, every barrier. business is unique, isn't it? Because I, I can comment, so I was telling Kate and Duncan before, so I'm one of seven kids, uh, five boys, two girls. So um, I, there, there are many of them I don't talk to anymore, and it's all my <laughs> fault, and that's that's very, very sad. I'm totally kidding. I talk to them all. Uh, uh, but, yeah, it's a uh, hel- healthy rivalry. Siblings siblings are awesome. And it's great to see you guys uh, really going to effort to work together tonight. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Great to be here. Wonderful. Um, So as per usual, when I have these conversations, so many different things I want to unpack. Um, But I want to start with, it's great to get a family-owned winery. Um, Lloyd's have a history with Coriol going back to uh, 1960-odd? Yeah, 1967. Am I right in saying it was Molly, Molly and Hugh? Yeah. Uh, who came along and purchased the Coriol site. I'm wondering how much of that history you can unpack for me uh, going from there, bringing it forward, and even maybe mixing a little bit of history in terms of the McLaren Vale wine region uh, in there as well, because it's a beautiful wine region. It's got such a rich history, produces beautiful wines, and part and parcel, like to me, one of the most enjoyable things about drinking wine is learning about where it came from. So... What yeah. you guys tell me about all of those things? <laughs> well, I'll try to keep it brief and then Duncan can butt in when he feels appropriate. But, um, no, I mean, look, wine has been produced in McLaren Vale for, you know, about 170 years. And um, when um, our grandparents discovered Coriol, I think there was about six sort of main uh, cellador wineries in McLaren Vale. Now there must be 80 or 85. Or, um, so obviously a very different landscape. And for them it was really the extension of, They'd had an almond orchard prior to that. They'd had a dairy, so it was the next agricultural pursuit, really. And um, it was also the scientific endeavour of of wine. And in the 60s, you know, the majority of wine produced in Australia was still fortified and it was either port or sherry and it didn't really have a high-quality status attached to it. Um, they had travelled pretty extensively through through Europe and obviously experienced the great dry table wines of Burgundy or Bordeaux or, um, or Hermitage. And, um, and so the timing was about right. It was about that time that, that you know, Henschke's had been bottling single vineyard dry red wines for 10, 15 years and, and, and Penfolds were doing the same and so, but it was still relatively fresh. You know, it's not like... Um, It's not like for the last 80 years or whatever, there'd been this great history of dry table wine being produced. Um, And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was, the timing was, I guess the timing was right. And it was, um, it was very small and it was actually already a winery um, rather optimistically called Chateau Bon Santé. And um, it was uh, producing vin naturel. So natural wine in in the sixties, biodynamically farmed. Before it was cool. It was a bit of a trendsetter. He was, he was 70 years ahead of his time, 50 years ahead of his time, but apparently the wine was awful. And um, the, the one surviving bottle we have has three distinct layers. The sort of top is clear, sort of white, uh, you know, water white. The middle is this sort of pinky colour and the bottom is brown sludge. And, um, and so anyway, he had obviously, he'd been here for, he'd been at the Coral for maybe seven or eight years. And, um, and then he went off to do other things. I think he got the calling and, and um, spread the word. Um, he was a Jehovah's Witness after leaving Coral and prior to Coral, he was an Encyclopedia Britannica salesman. So he sort of leap, you know, leapfrog from one thing to another. And, um, 
But what it left was the foundation, I guess, of a very small rudimentary winery, but also some very old vines, um, you know, vines that date back to probably 1865. And, um, and so, um, yeah, the scene was set for, um, I don't think the intention was to, to set out to create, you know, a, a global brand or a, um, it was a very, very different time. And it was just, you know, a, a slow foot in the water. And um, there were some pretty early successes, which I think buoyed them on to, um, to continue on with, um, yeah, with making wine. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for our grandfather, Hugh, it was like Pete mentioned, it was quite of a, a bit of a scientific you know pursuit for him and um he was you know just quite interested in the science behind I, I remember sort of dad talking about you know one of the first things he did was was go and buy a ph meter because you know nobody in the time in those days <laughs> measured anything really um definitely didn't you know look at ph and i mean if you go through four years of like wine training at adelaide uni basically what you take out of that four years is you know how important pH is. It's sort of the one you know, standard um, thing that's re- you know really important to you know have a good um, understanding of when you're when you're making wine. So yeah, you think about some of those things that he kind of went through and was really, I guess, interested in. And um, I think about some of the equipment we have today, though. You know, these machines where we can you know we can and then twenty seconds we can measure you know alcohol and pH and acids, and it's sort of pretty amazing the the I guess, um, you know, how the industry has changed over the last sort of 50 years. That, that's fascinating. On, on that point, I just, I just want to ask your, your perspectives on terms of like old world versus new world. And a lot of people can get, you know, you get caught up in the romance of wine and these stories of these old, you know, French winemakers. They may not necessarily be scientists or understand the, the scientific methods, but they've got such an intimate knowledge of the the land and the weather that they just know how to craft these wines. The role that science plays in modern winemaking, viticulture and technique, et cetera, you'd be pretty w- would you agree with the the proposition that the the better scientific knowledge that we have regarding all the things, the better our wines are going to be. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think having access to all of that and uh, all of the yeah, scientific understanding we have, particularly in viticulture these days, is is huge. Um, I guess there's how much you use that. Um, there's no, in my, for my opinion, it's it's you'd rather have as much knowledge as you can, and then you can sort of decide, you know, how much you kind of you know get led by that, um, but you're better off to kind of yeah have that grounding but saying that i think you know there definitely is something about having knowledge of a vineyard and a site over you know 10 20 30 um, years and it is quite fascinating you know we can look back at you know 50 years of coriol shiraz from this site um, and there's some real common threads you know there's some we see the changes in sort of winemaking over the decades um in terms of maybe oak use or you know alcohol levels but there's still this real common thread of you know of flavor and um you know personality personality through all those wines so uh, you know and f- times will change you know what different winemakers will have different opinions and and do different things but yeah ultimately the site will will kind of be you know pretty important and shine through in, in your wines so i think the point is that um you know <laughs> Uh, how do you frame this? You, people think that they can learn things quickly um, and like to be able to think that they can learn things quickly. But every day you're humbled by realising that you can't when you're working with wine. And, you know, I remember 2017 vintage and it was just raining, you know, and it doesn't rain really during, during vintage. And um, and sort of scratching my head and and talking to you know my my dad and saying well, what do you think you know and he sort of scratches his head a bit and goes well yeah you know it is a bit like 1976 isn't it you know and 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 so you're going back 40 years but that's the last time you had a vintage like this and you have a reference point and you know the challenges that you might have had dealing with that vintage and um and so yeah it's it's you learn the more that you're in the industry the the more that you learn that you need a very long-term outlook and a long-term outlook is your friend 
as long as you're willing to accept new ideas and new techniques and, and, um, and ways of doing things. A great example is, you know, like um, we, if we didn't change our methodology or our understanding or, or pursuit of, of, of what we're, uh, of our craft, we would, we would be producing things that we were producing in the 70s and 80s, like Pinot Noir, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. Um, they've all been grown at Coriol <laughs> and, um, and there's but bottles of them in the cellar. But of course, now you'd never think to plant any of those varieties in the Clara Vale. It sort of shows how far education has come and you have to be part of that and absorb that information that's available to us. Okay. A couple of questions based on that. Um, so you guys... I believe play with some pretty old vines. You've referred to old vines and um, certain vines. I'm not sure if they're still running. Please let me know. But going back to you mentioned 18 something, and I think I've read that there are some Shiraz vines dating back to 1919 19 or something along those lines. Yeah, it was a bit of a um, the old vines that you use, etc. How, how old are some of those in terms of what? Well, we originally thought we were told that the the original planting was 1919. That's what we were. That was the first time that vines were planted, which is when a lot of vineyards were planted in McLaren Vale post First World War. Um, and um, but then we, my auntie, who was writing a book on the almond uh, the almond industry in McLaren Vale, which used to be enormous, um, you know, hundred years ago. Um, it came across a paragraph written in 1875 in the South Australian Register that referenced our property, which was then called Clark Hill, and talks about this little vineyard. And this, this, and it talks about the position of the vineyard and, and the size of the vineyard and where it was positioned on the block, and that is exactly where our old vineyard was. And so you sort of start to scratch your head and like, hold on. So actually there were vines planted here. So this was 1875, talking about the wines have been produced. So it must have been planted probably around the same times as the, the old buildings on the estate were, were built around 1860, 1865. So, um, yeah, it's given us an extra, you know, 50, 70 years worth of worth of history, which sort of makes sense for, for some other reasons. So very old vineyard, but a very healthy vineyard, bottom of the hill, deep, you know, free draining soil. Um, Shiraz was always planted at the bottom of the hill, uh, being less drought tolerant than Grenache or Matara that was planted further up the hill. And um, so that's a great, yeah, it's a great resource. And then we have another few old vineyards, another 100-year-old vineyard in Wollonga. And um, and then the rest of the block is really planted predominantly to Shiraz that, that was planted when our grandparents started so in, the, in the late 60s. Okay. Really interested in asking you guys more questions about the varietals, et cetera, but I just want to return to the family story. So I think you, you've both referred to your grandfather, one of the early figures in terms of the, the wine influences in your family, um, your grandfather, your father, then you two. Like, can you actually answer, where did the wine come from? I'm always really interested to talk to people about, like, how it, how it started. Was he, he just loved wine and he decided, I'm going to have a crack at this wine thing, or he, it was in his family where... Um, maybe. Yeah, well, no, the problem for him was that he was raised Methodist and he was the first, like, I think his father and his great-grandfather and his great-great-grandfather and his great-great-great-grandfather were all Methodist ministers and teetotal. And so when my... Grand, <laughs> you know, and so I think my grandfather was um, was uh, certainly it shunned the religious side of, of things and... Um, and so, but for him, it was really agriculture was his interest. He was a, a doctor by trade, but his agriculture was his real interest. And um, and so this was the next the next thing. There was also interest in wine as a um, you know very moderate consumption of wine um, in a very French manner uh, with a meal um, that suited their lifestyle. And and so. Um, I think it was just the timing was right. As I mentioned earlier, the change was from these sort of fortified styles of wine into, I guess, finer examples of, of, of wine. And so there was obviously some probably health benefit, whether there was a little bit of rebellion from his father that he clashed with, I'm not quite sure. And, um, and I think it was still a, it was still an, it was an issue. It was an issue for my great grandfather that his son was going into the alcohol industry and even I think when my dad came into the business, I still think there was this slight bit of, 
oh, not reluctance, but just very vague concern, generational concern that, you know, that they were going into the alcohol industry. So, um, but then, of course, the culture and the, everything else takes over and it's much more important than, than any of that baggage, I guess. So. <laughs> this, this might be hard for you to answer, but just in terms of extrapolating on that story through the, the wider McLaren Vale region, I remember talking to Bruce Tyrrell, um, Tyrrell's in the hunt zone. He was telling me a story sort of when he was growing up. Um, he dated somebody. I can't remember if he ended up marrying the person, but point being, the story was that he was looked on as almost a, a black sheep because he was involved in the wine industry. And at that time, it was, you know, if you were involved in alcohol, there was this stigma that attached to that. Are you aware of whether or not there was some sort of similar? similar trend in the McLaren Vale? Was there a big Methodist population down there? If you can't answer it, that's okay. No, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, um, it certainly wasn't a developed, like a large developed industry like maybe some other parts of Australia like the Hunter or the Barossa. It was really mixed farming for, it's only in the last 30 or 30 years or so that it's really become predominantly viticulture. Um, and I think it was just, uh, you know, it was another farming pursuit. Like you had almonds, like you had wheat, you, you know, you had some vineyard. And um, But it probably wasn't this really strong embedded cultural reason for wine existing in McLaren Vale. It was just a good place to grow grapes and, and people saw the opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. Was it a fate complete that your father was going to follow in his father's footsteps? No, I don't know. no, not at all. I don't think he. Um, yeah, he. I think he studied science and became a teacher, and then he, um, then he was he a social worker, which I find very hard to believe because he's not the most compassionate human but um, <laughs> but um you know he was a drifter in that he would just get interested with the next thing here and there and everywhere and um he actually i think his first foray in making wine was actually in england um, my mother was english and um and they were spending some time living in england and he got a job in uh in, i guess it was in kent or sorry maybe making wine and um and at that stage it was all i don't I'm not sure if Roseworthy had, was the course, had the course started? I don't know. Anyway, he was from a science background, okay, so I get yeah. that. Um, but he naturally probably, his father certainly, well, pa, pa, uh, uh, Hugh certainly would have um, not discouraged him, but would have said, well, you know, he'd have to earn the right to work here. Um, it certainly wouldn't be a given. And um so I guess he sort of did probably what Duncan and I both did and went away for a fair amount of time and um, to kind of earn your learn your trade and get perspective and um, and uh, so I don't yeah I don't think for him it was I think it was a great way for him to to you know fill, fulfill all of his various passions and interests and and it was just a good vehicle for that um, but it's also over the last 40 or 50 years become an invaluable resource and a leader in the industry so it's sort of mm. the way things turn out okay let's get up close and personal you two growing up in a family uh like the lloyd's illustrious wine reputation what was that like so did you guys grow up drinking wine, working in vineyards or, your, you know, rat bags? Give me, give me all the dirty details. Uh, we grew up here on, on site. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, looking back now, this is, you know, it's, it's sort of become a much of a bigger, a bigger kind of venture than it was, you know, 30 years ago. Um, but I guess for us as kids, it was, you know, it was our backyard really. Yep. Um, so, you know, that was always a lot of fun and, and we had, you know, extended family, um, I think it's 12 of us cousins that would, you know, would sort of be get together, you know, regularly every week. And so it'd be quite a big, you know, it'd be quite a big sort of family events. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess, you know, wine was always part of that and the discussions around the family table, but it was more about a big, a pretty just sort of happy, you know, joyous occasion every week and um, food and wine and company and cousins running around. So it was a pretty, you know, I guess. Yeah, it certainly wasn't like we were sort of 
sitting there being reverent to wine and wine is all glorious. <laughs> you know, it was there was a bottle of wine on the table, like there was food yeah. on the table, like there was, you know, con- confronting conversation. And and so it was just a very natural um, introduction, I guess. Um, the one thing that was quite good was the, the understanding of taste and flavour and so there was a lot of tasting that went on in our family, whether it would be, um, I don't know, olive oil or butter or whatever it might be, but we're obviously very encouraged to, to develop your palate and, and to understand, you know, the differences of, 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 of this and that. But um, it certainly wasn't, um, what's the word? Yeah, there was certainly nothing forced about it. It was just a very natural ease, um, which hopefully sort of continues on now because you want, you know, with wine, you have to create an exceptional product that, that goes without saying and, and it has to be phenomenal and, you know, you, 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 um, you want to build a great reputation for your brand. But you also want people to just naturally enjoy your wine and not to kind of make it something otherworldly or ridiculous you know it's um which is is maybe the wrong way of looking at things maybe you should be kind of uh, uh what's the word um trying to turn every bottle into a masterpiece and trying to prevent present that picture but for the most part you know you want to make fantastic wines you want people to just enjoy them naturally and, and not in a forced ridiculous manner yes yeah and i guess there's, there was always that attitude that um you know, you, you look at a wine, a Coriol wine, for example, you look at it, you know, properly. Dad, Dad's probably always been one of the strongest critics and would be, you know, um, be very open and honest around the table about what he liked about this wine or didn't like about that and I want that to change. And I guess it's that always, um, yeah, instilling that idea that you're kind of always looking, looking for improvements um, and that, yeah, really it's... Um, yeah, it's not um, it's not all about some you know amazing kind of product that can't can't be accessed by you know anyone really, um, and that's important. It's it's wine for the table and it's wine for yeah for the conversation and um, you know it should be should be able to be enjoyed by everyone. Okay, C- a couple of questions based on that. Oh, sorry, you there, guys? Yeah, I'll be able to. Yep. Edit. Sorry, just a slight issue on my end. Um, Tasting. Um, growing up, did you guys drink anything other than Coriol wines? Yeah, I think yeah, it was sample the, the competition, <laughs> etc. Yeah, there was um, probably not as much as we do now in that imported wine was still not like, you know, in the 90s or whatever, imported wine was not as accessible it is, as it is now. And, um, but, and there wasn't the volume sort of available to look at. But, um, no, it was always that, like a, at a family dinner, there would be Coriol and, and lots of other things on the table. It was certainly never just, um, you know, like, you know, I, I sort of cringe when I see winemakers go into a restaurant and order their own wine. I just think, what the hell are you doing? This is your opportunity to try something else. I mean, it's um, so, no, we um, were certainly encouraged to taste very widely and, um, and, and, and still do. We make a big point of uh, um, internally with a lot of tastings to, um, to, to drink widely and, and, and taste widely. And um, that's, that's where a lot of the great pleasure comes from. Okay. And the other question I wanted to ask, um, just based on some comments you made earlier, you're talking about develop, developing your palate at a your palate at a young age, exposure to a lot of different things. Um, as a you know young person going on that wine journey, trying to develop that palate, is is that just the best way to do it? Try lots of different things. If you're walking down the road, pick up a rock, suck on it, and go, oh yeah, that's something I haven't tried before. Is it is it just exposure? Um, yeah, to lots yeah. of different flavors. And you can do it with, you know, do it with apples. Like, yeah, you, you assume an apple is an apple, but then you put a Granny Smith and a Royal Gala and, a, you know, six different apples in front of you and try a slice of each, and they're so incredibly different. And um, and so it's a good way to start developing your, your palate. Obviously, wine costs money. Money. And um, and so the um, a lot of the wine studies that I've done, the best experiences are with the tasting groups that you form. Um, 
because, you know, there might be six of you and there's $2,000 of wine on the table, but you've only bought a few hundred dollars of it and you're, you know, trying wine. And now Coravan has completely changed that. You know, I wish I was doing my studies of wine when Coravan was around. But, um, the um, yeah, to just try as widely as you possibly can is, but at least have some theme and some reference point that you're, that you're looking to achieve. And so, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be with wine. It can be with all sorts of, all sorts of food products. Yeah, well, any yeah, like you say, any product, and it's it's trying to, it's really just trying to um, uh, also understand your own palate. Um, I find that we, uh, you know, for example, me and and Pete, when we're in the same room, you know, um, taste wine together, and we we kind of, I I think we have um, similar ideas often about wines, but we will sort of describe them in different ways, or we'll we'll kind of focus on on different things and and with our dad is the same you know he'll um he'll describe you know different things about a wine use different language and different terminology and that's it's sort of quite fascinating um i think particularly with people you taste with a lot you kind of get to understand what they're kind of talking about when they you know use a certain term uh, but yeah it's really trying to understand you know the language and uh, and make those links between um, you know, what you're smelling and tasting, but actually getting it into, you know, language to, to, to convey to other people. Well, that's the kind of, that's often the trick, really. Okay. Just need to jump in at this point, guys. Are you guys getting that countdown in the, uh, at the top? You're not seeing anything yeah. fun there? Yeah. Okay. Do you mind if I just need to take three minutes and upgrade my subscription, which has obviously lapsed? <laughs> it's been, no, no, that's been a while since I've used Zoom. This is so embarrassing. Sorry, guys. No, no, no. Awful. Um, bear with me. Reasoning block for tasting notes. That was going to me. Hi, it's Reasoning. Mm. Holding on. Oh, I thought it was going to be okay. Nah, I'm all good. All right, you're updated. Okay. I think we're in business now. Guys, Murphy's Law. Yeah. And then there's a there's Murphy's Law as well, which is uh, multiply the Murphy factor by about three. Sorry about that. Um, now, um, I'll just ask you a question and we'll get back into it. Don't worry, I'll, I'll be able to clean this all up afterwards. Um, just continuing on the subject of tasting, and I, th I think it's something that, well, maybe people within the, the inner sanctum of the wine world discuss, but I know I've definitely been uh, at dinners where it's been discussed with me and my mates, et cetera, wine tasting, objective or subjective in terms of people, you know, they'll, they'll taste something like this and they'll get certain characters from it and somebody else may taste it and smell it and get something completely different. In your opinions, is there scope? for disagreement as to what people are getting or are there certain characters that know you really should be getting that from that wine and if you're getting something different, you're just not cut out <laughs> the sniffing and tasting? I think a lot uh, of that is probably um, the more you taste, the better you become at articulating what you're tasting and mm -hmm. therefore probably the less um, the less broad the range of descriptors would be um, in that if you are looking at a Cabernet Sauvignon and you would 
petite, like you would expect to see Cassie, Graphite, Aniseed, you know, for example. Um, it's probably less likely that you're going to see watermelon, guava and passion fruit um, that you might see in, you know, Sauvignon or something. So, you know, I think that you, there should be a frame of reference that might not be like this, it might be like this, but as you taste, you should probably, um, that should probably come down a little bit because, you know, um, different varieties have, well, a, a variety would, would have a range of descriptors available to it. That's based on the fact that it's grown in a region that allows it to express its varietal typicity um, because, you know, if you grow a Pinot Noir in a warm year in McLaren Vale, it's probably not going to, you know, faithfully represent its varietal typicity, um, if you like. So, um, no, I certainly think that there's a little bit of room, but certainly... Um, uh, you would expect there to be consistency to a point. Duncan, what do you think? My answer is um, say what you like and there should <laughs> be later. Var- variations good. And, um, yeah, I, it's a hard one. I, it, but, yeah, I think people, you know, and it has also been shown scientifically that people will, you know, people see different different concentrations of certain compounds, you know, will... Um, you know, present differently to different people. And so, you know, where some person sees passion fruit and others sees, you know, reductive character and, and that's sort of a scientific fact. And, um, or, you know, some people won't see a mouse in this tank where I know people who will literally be gag dry reaching if a wine is, you know, slightly mousy. So it's a hard one because there's, you know, I think you have to uh, also appreciate the the differences in people's, um, you know, in people's sensory kind of, um, you know, sensory abilities and and what they what they can see. Mm-hmm. You're giving a man out, aren't you, Duncan? All those inexperienced tasters, you just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Duncan. Um, now, is, is there a, a a third voice, the dog? Who's the dog? Uh, yeah, I have a dog here who's um, begging me to take her home, I think. But there's <laughs> yeah, uh, an eight-month-old beagle, Jack Russell, who's um, doing pretty well but likes to go crazy at delivery, new delivery men who are um, as, coming to the winery. As every Jack Russell should. I used to have a Jack Russell cross staffy. And uh, growing up, it was just manic, just a crazy dog. 18 years of absolute mayhem on this street. Um, <laughs> uh, Something else to look forward to, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Duncan, be warned. Um, yeah. Uh, Peter and Duncan, sorry, I'm, the, I'm a sucker for a rabbit hole. So I'm just going to climb back out of this one, get back to your story. Um, so you, you've grown up. The winery is your backyard. It's part and parcel of... Your, your childhood experience. Um, you guys go away and d- do other do other things, work other jobs before coming back and joining in the uh, the ranks of the family business. Yeah, yeah, I think growing up, we were both sort of told that there's certainly no pressure to go into the family business, and probably more so if it is something that you would ever consider, then you have to make yourself the right person for the job and the right person for the job is the person that has the skills and experience and attributes rather than because your family, Um, you know, just because your family doesn't mean you're the right person for the job. And so um, that was firmly entrenched in us. Um, And so I think Duncan was probably a little more clear on his path. I mean, I, I certainly wasn't, I, um, I went away and um, I tried to finish a degree and I started five or six, I think before I finally finished one, but, would keep on going overseas and I spent a lot of time in France and I got involved in um, food and and specifically bread making and um, and that was um, that was great and then spent time in England and making cider and doing other things with food and and um, and uh, and drinks and then um, but eventually found my way back um, to it but that was a sort of a 10-year Thing. And then I went and worked for other wine companies and um, before coming back after sort of 15 plus years away 
and um, and so that's um, that's great. I'm really glad for that and the perspective it's given me, and also the feeling like okay, well, I've got you know at least half of what it takes to to continue this business on. Um, and Duncan, you were probably the same but different, weren't you? Yeah, I think um, you know I feel like some people always want to hear you know oh, I was four years old and I you know. You know <laughs> Dreamt, oh, you only dreamt of being a winemaker and it's not quite like that. But um, I guess maybe you kind of re- rebel against that a little bit because you sort of grow up and you think it'd be quite interesting, but you sort of think, oh, is that a bit of the obvious, you know, thing to do? Um, but I think when I was, you know, last year of high school and looking at all my options and, uh, you know, looking at what other things I could study and just nothing particularly grabbed me um and so i went straight into winemaking and i think now now i think i have no idea what else i'd do i love this profession and you know um i have no idea what else i would have done so i'm sort of glad i went into it but uh yeah then the pretty classic i guess sort of finish you know finish a degree um through adelaide uni and then three three or four years doing vintages in you know australia and overseas and then five years sort of working full-time for another another Australian wine company before you know, making the move back back to Coriol. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, good good sort of breadth of experience and um, you know, seen a lot. So, yeah. Okay. And P- Peter referred to his uh, travels, time spent in France, uh, England. Well, what about yourself? Where have uh, your travels taken you, Duncan? Yeah, through through Europe. So I worked in Italy and Germany and France and spent quite a bit of time, a few months traveling with some other sort of peers through Italy in, in particular, um, you know, just tasting, just visiting wineries. And then you'd sort of do, do a vintage in France and then, you know, kind of catch up with a, you know, someone else who'd done a vintage in the northern France and you'd catch up and spend two weeks tasting through sort of Champagne and Burgundy. And so, yeah, it was a great, you know, it was a great time. And you know, sometimes I wonder why I didn't do that for a few more years. But um, anyway, decided to, I guess you get to that point where you think a full-time job is also, you know, beneficial and um, should be done. So, but yeah, it was a great experience. And, and you know, we sort of always had the luxury of kind of a, a bit of a family base in the UK as well. So it made, us, made it quite easy. And I think Pete and I, you know, he was maybe making cider and I was making wine and then we, you know, had a weekend in Tuscany tasting wine. So, you know, we had some, yeah, some pretty nice experiences um, sort of together and, and with other friends and family um, for sure. Okay. And in terms of what you pick up while you're doing vintages over in Europe, um, they may have, you know, older, more traditional methods, et cetera. But is there, is there a lot that you've learned over there that you've, you know, brought into your winemaking techniques here, or is it completely different? Modern techniques first old, or is that sort of a you know, a bit of a false distinction? Is that a question? Yeah. I don't think it's um, I don't think it's maybe as varied as you know. Sometimes it's it's put out there to be. You know, saying that, um, you kind of look at some wineries you might work at overseas and go, well, with a few, you know, a few simple little changes in their cellar they could you know you you can maybe you know make um you know big differences but it's probably as much about the tastings and the visits and the people you talk to you know everyone you talk to and taste wine with they they have a slightly different you know style they have a slightly different methods um but it might just you know might might just be the fact that their wineries you know set up a certain way and that's the equipment they have and um it's sort of been like that and this is the result they get and so there's kind of little snippets from everywhere really um and and i guess what it sometimes does is back here you kind of think oh you know maybe i'd be interested to try that and you sort of have a bit more confidence to to um you know give something a go because you're like oh well they were doing that i remember the guy i was talking you know talking to in you know shadow nerf and and they would sort of use this technique so let's sort of give it a go and um so i think you know all that that breadth of experience is pretty pretty handy in mm. terms of you know what we do here in the cellar okay question for both of you now in terms of returning to the family business i find it fascinating that of 
the, the vast majority of the multi-generational businesses are uh, family businesses that I'm familiar with. Vast majority of them are wine related um, outside of a, you know, a wine related context. Um, you know, a father wanting to pass his business on to his son. Most of the time, either in my professional experience, you know, good, good luck with that. Unless you're just giving them a large sum of money and you're saying, take this and run with it. Most of the times I make a complete hash of it and then it'll be gone. Whereas in, in the wine world, there seems to be, I don't want to romanticize it too much, but this intergenerational understanding or um, transfer of responsibility that seems to happen pretty seamlessly for the most part. And I've spoken to a, a number of different uh, wine families and some, some really old, some not so old, and it never, there's no expectation from the previous generations that the, the later generations are going to pick that up and run with it, or even if there is, it's not forced, but there seems to be more often than not a readiness on the part of the, the kids to pick up what, you know, dad and mum created and run with it. And I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are on why, whether it's just as easy as, you know, being called home and in a really cliche way, picking that, picking that up and running with it, or is it just something, a product you're really passionate about? Because like from my perspective, I've, I've had very little experience to, you know, I'm not from a, a wine making family. So the idea of being a winemaker is something that, when I was younger, would have been completely foreign. I just love wine now. Um, whereas, you know, you're a winemaker and Peter, you're the general manager. I'm right in saying that. Yeah, of a, of a, of a winery. So talk to me. <laughs> well, I think the, um, you know, wine is and should be long term. You know, like the, the making of wine, the growing of grapes, it's long term. You know, you, if you want to see, uh, what's an example? An example might be a vineyard that we planted probably 20 years ago um, of Shiraz on a, on a site. Next, like we bought the property into our estate, it was an almond orchard, and we planted Shiraz. For 10 years, the Shiraz was all right, but it wasn't that good. You know, and then so you start making some changes and you think, all right, what can we try? And then after 13 or 14 years, you start to see some improvement. And then you spend a few years refining that. And then by year 20, you're like, oh, yeah, this is good. You know, we're still going to improve it, but it's good. And it's like, what other industry do you kind of invest that much time and energy and effort in trying to create something? Because you get one shot each year to demonstrate what this bit of land's possible of, of doing and then you get vintage variation and you get winemaker variation and then you get you know consumer demand and all that sort of stuff and so your outlook is 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 necessarily long term and um and so that's probably why family wine businesses you know do have to sort of navigate multiple generations is because there's so much to to do and to see and to learn and that's continuous and so the great asset of having our dad who you know is, has, 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 has seen 40 years is the perspective and we can quiz him on that and understand and, and he's changed his mind probably 10 times in that period about various things and we'll continue to do the same. But um, the, that transference of knowledge um, is, is very important and there's just a seamless way that that happens in a family. You don't sit down with a new recruit and sort of unload 40 years worth of experience and expect them to kind of absorb it it's just something that happens naturally by what's the word symbiosis or you know by sitting around and having this conversation each year or it's the gradual transference of knowledge so i think necessarily you know why and as opposed to some other industries you know it needs to be long term so therefore you know it's like what do they have in in japan those multi-generational mortgages because you know properties are so expensive, so so you 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 buy this property, but you know you're only going to have one kid, and so you both sign the mortgage, and you know the mortgage goes for seventy years or whatever. You know it's sort of um, so you know I mean, but then it gets to a point, I guess, where you you need to um, Duncan and I have cousins um, who aren't um, 
is involved in sort of day-to-day -day stuff. But at some point after three generations, then perhaps there needs to be some consolidation. Um, depends how big your family is, I guess. But, mm. um, you know, you can get through 40, 50, 60, 70 years without it being too much of a, of a drama. So, yeah. Yeah, but you have to be, you know, I think you have to be um, set up for that and you have to know that's the kind of, it's a, it's a bit more of a slow burn. It's not a... Um, you know, we're not going to come in here sort of guns blazing and and suddenly, you know, you know, turn this into this business, you know, into some, you know, ch change it radic radically in five years' time. That's sort of not really the way it – and some people probably try that and maybe they maybe they get lucky, but, you know, probably often – more often than not doesn't really work. Um, whereas, yeah, I think like Pete says, it's sort of you know, that attitude of, yeah, the sort of longer-term approach and – and you know, enjoy the lifestyle of it. It's um, mm. you know, it's, it's a it's a pretty nice place to rock up to work every day. And um, sometimes you've just got to remind yourself of that. And um, you know, it's a pretty nice industry to be in. So it's um, yeah, it's a good place to be. Yeah, lo love what you both said, especially just in my my personal opinion. In a world that is so fast paced and kind of transactional, I really find those comments refreshing just want to dig a little bit deeper um family so mom dad you guys got other siblings there's a third yeah there's a brother he's a scientist he lives in england well in wales yeah. actually so he, he didn't get the wine bug no he's academic and he sorry he's not doing wine science <laughs> no no there might be some transfer down the track no he's a he's a plant geneticist and he's um you know he's got a lab in um, at the university in in um, in in Wales, and he um, no, very focused academic. Probably couldn't be anything but an academic. I mean, he's so focused on his very. I don't really even know what he does. Something that is very confusing, but <laughs> <laughs> sort of. I think he's saving the world in some way. But um, <laughs> but he's he's got a great palate, and I love you know tasting with him and and um, and getting his opinions. Um, so, um, but no, he's. Uh, He's not involved with us anyway, in that sense, no. <clears throat> so it's three boys. Yep. Gee, that yep. would have been a hoot growing up. You know, five boys and two girls was interesting because we still had two girls to kind of balance out the, the impact that five boys can have on the world. But that's just a concentrated dose of, you know, three guys. Well, it was, you know, 100 plus acres, so it was plenty yeah. of space. So kind of <laughs> yeah, okay. Run off steam. And, um, yep. <laughs> yep. Happy days. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the winery. So you got and your, your varietals, etc. So you got very famous, wonderful reds, um, but you've also got these terrific, groovy, heat-resistant European styles. Yeah, yeah, your pick poles, etc. Um, let's just canvas quickly what you guys are doing, what you're really excited about, um, and some you know a bit of a look into the future for for Coriol. Yeah. It's it's sort of, it's pretty fascinating. And I think um, it's always nice to kind of bring people through the winery and taste a lot of things out of barrel because, you know, we, we pretty much, even though we, you know, basically making wine from McLaren Vale, we, we cover a fair broad spectrum of wine styles. Um, you know, even with reds, we're sort of, you know, playing around with some things. We've got some stuff in the winery this year that, you know, some 11 11.5% alcohol of sun so that's sort of more like a you know heavy rosé light red really fresh and vibrant um you know through to you know these are more classic uh, richer richer bodied shiraz um and sort of everything in, in between um so that's you know that's really exciting and that's you know that it really all starts back in the kind of Sangiovese being one of the first um, sort of other varieties, I guess, that, that dad really got interested in in the, in the mid-80s. Um, that's really driven then, I guess, a, a lot of the, the other varieties that we've planted and sort of styles that we look for. And a lot of that is looking for, you know, um, other you know, wines with a bit more savouriness and structure and things that suit different foods, um, food styles and, and think about our kind of climate and, and um, you know, food that we have in, even in this region. So, uh, yeah, it's sort of some pretty interesting stuff going on. We're loving, you know, Nero Davila at the moment. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. 
Sorry, super quickly. So yeah, your Nero and your San Giovese. So I was walking in here tonight and I thought maybe it would just be a little bit too cl- cliche for me to be drinking Coriol or talking to the guys from Coriol. So I went with the, uh, the 2014 Le Cat Noir Pinot, which is way, uh, I, I just looked and I thought that thing's got to go. So I may as well drink it. And it's, uh, it's a little bit past its window, I think. It's, you know, it's not bad, but I thought... It would just not be appropriate for me to open the two Coriol bottles of wine. I'm really looking forward to drinking as weeknight quaffers. So they're still sitting there, and I'm going to enjoy them in the future. Or I just don't know. Yeah, it's, um, no, it's and yeah, some really interesting whites. Um, yeah, the pig pour you mentioned before. You know, that's a, a variety that Dad brought in from um, you know first cuttings from France and makes this like really uh quite racy driven um you know sort of aromatic steely white from McLaren Vale and and works well in this region so it's really nice to be able to kind of get that style um you know out of this region and then through to you know then for some Fiano that we you know encourage more richness and texture so you can really have a more full, fuller bodied white um and really got a diversity of styles from from this region, but that's using you know Pickpool and Fiano, you know, th- two varieties that are not exactly mainstream, but that's probably what you need to do in this region in particular to to kind of um, get those styles. And I think a lot of people always say, oh, you know, why do you why do you you know plant these varieties? Or I guess part of the response is well, why not? Um, there's no variety that's native to Australia. I think people kind of forget that a bit. Then, you know, everything was imported here at some point with Shiraz or Cabernet, and they were just sort of the varieties that that made it initially. Um, and there's a huge, diverse you know, amount of varieties, you know, um, throughout Europe. And so let's, you know, try some of these things. And um, yeah, yeah, we're so very we're- young. You know, even with, you know, we might talk about having some of the oldest vines in the world, but we're also one of the youngest sort of viticultural industries in the world. Um, and so there is, we're, we're, as a country, still on a major learning curve and, and that should continue. Um, you should also be able to consolidate down to the things that you're doing really well and feel happy with, but you should never stop that kind of pursuit of looking for what suits, what's great. And that's changing as well, you know, as the climate warms and, um, and what's going to be good, not just now, but in 20 years, 50 years, 80 years time. Um, so, um, yeah, we have, everyone's, you've got to remind yourself that we're a very, very, very young industry relative to, to not all of the, most of the old world. Mm-hmm. And just jumping on something you, you've both just been talking about, um, that, that would you call it social responsibility um, in terms of winemaking techniques, care for the environment, et cetera, that's something that really seems to be um, taking a, a central kind of focus in a, a lot of wineries and um, yeah. spoken with Chester from Darrenberg, McLaren Vale, and that's a massive part of what they do. And I've been reading about you guys, and that seems to be a pretty heavy focus, um, big focus on, am I right in saying, like solar energy, et cetera, and what, what impact does that have on your winemaking technique? Is it, is it just something you do as part of your responsibility or do you think it adds to the, the wines? Well, I think because you, you know, when you can sit there and have as your observational point vintage that, you know, might start, you know, 30, 50 years ago probably started, you know, much later than it, than it does typically now, although the last few years have been quite late. Um, but each year you sort of see it's earlier and earlier and earlier and it's warmer and warmer and warmer and drier and drier and drier. Um, then it, it's so obvious and so evident. And so your, um, uh, your responsibility is heightened because you're seeing what's happening around you. Thankfully for, for us, for, for, for winemakers and vineyards, especially in McLaren Vale, it's very easy to farm organically. Um, we see the benefit that that brings to a vineyard, even in a short period of time, the benefit that you can bring to a vineyard that hasn't been farmed organically to, and, you know, um, to, to being farmed organically. We're not yet certified. We will be once we 
organize our, our vineyard slightly better. But um, so that's really important. Um, the water management is hugely important because um, water, like it or not, is is important as a as a source of irrigation for for water. Uh, you think about McLaren Vale originally; um, it was one of the biggest uh, almond growing areas in in Australia. And um, but almonds as a crop are very thirsty; probably take ten times the amount of water than, than viticulture. So actually, viticulture is relatively well suited, but um, it's not good if you've got a salty bore and um, and continually p- pulling out of the aquifer is not a sustainable long-term approach. So there's the Wollonga Basin Recycled Water Scheme. So we now have um, all of our vineyards by one uh, uh, either connected or going to be connected to um, Wollonga Basin Recycled Water, which is a fully sustainable long-term resource. And then solar, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. Like you have massive energy bills, and um, because it, it, you know, in summer when we need a lot of refrigeration capability, highly energy resource um, um, intensive uh, resource, and so we, um, but it's also when we can be producing the most energy. So um, January, February, March, um, we need a lot of refrigeration, but the sun shines and we produce more energy than we need. So um, it's um, for us to kind of tick off those three main pillars. It means that we can. Yeah, we can be pretty um, conscientious and and um, have a strong commitment to sustainability. There's a lot of extra work to do around, you know, where's our glass being manufactured? How much more local glass can we source? All that sort of stuff. But um, absolutely, it, thankfully, it's a it's an industry that can quite easily, um, uh, what's the word, maintain a strong commitment to to sustainability for sure. Mm-hmm. Duncan, nothing to, nothing to add. Not going to disagree. Well, yeah. Look, um, it's a, a good marketing spiel. Um, no, it's uh, covers. <laughs> no, it covers all the bases, and it. But it's all. It is. It. It is. It is true. I mean, it's a like Pete mentioned. It's. It's a pretty good place, uh, McLaren Vale, to to kind of do all those things. It's well set up, um, and. And but yeah, we but also we see the results and you know the work we do we've been doing in the vineyard in particular. Um, you know, gone are the days of sort of having these bare bare earth under vines. We sort of we kind of let a lot of stuff grow, a lot of weeds. We just have a better understanding of that now, and we kind of look at what's what's growing. Um, you have basically have continuous growth of of things under vine throughout the whole year. So we're really keeping you know, soil, um, you know, soil alive and, and active. And and you can pretty quickly, you know, you can measure your soil carbon levels. And we've seen even in 10 years, you know, they're, they're pretty good. Yeah, they, they've been increasing and they're actually, you know, very good levels, um, you know, which is a great, it's great to be able to see those results. And, you know, then I think, and that, it based, you know, and naturally it leads through to, you know, healthier, healthier vines, healthier canopies, um, and then therefore into, you know, better balanced wines. Um, it's a pretty kind of easy link to make. So I guess it's just making a few, it's making a few of those leaps and it's, it's sort of, um, you know, but I, but I think there's sort of better science and understanding. There's a lot of work going into kind of, you know, vit- understanding viticulture and soils in the last sort of 10, 15 years. And um, I think sort of following some of that and using some of your own observations, um, you know, you just sort of have to dive in a little bit. And, and we've even, you know, we've even made changes, you know, still on organic principles, but we've made, you know, we've made quite a few changes in the last five years. Um, things that we've tried and thought, you know, it was really good to get us off herbicides, but no, we're going to change, um, you know, change back to, you know, change different techniques now. So we're always learning. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it's been a really important part of our, our journey um, for sure. Okay. And then it's it's great, you know. We we have people here on site, you know, hundreds of people each each week, and so um, you know, to be able to very easily show people what we are doing in the vineyard, you know, vineyards are right there. We're not hiding anything, um, you know, and, and to be able to sort of show people what we're doing is you know great as well. And Peter, you briefly referred to the uh, certification process that you guys are currently going through. Can you give me the uh, thirty second version of? what goes into that because i've heard that's quite an ordeal uh, bit of a process 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, I guess the challenge that we have is that we have four different vineyards across McLaren Vale and slightly different ownership structures. So you basically need to get all of your vineyards or the, the accreditation body to 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 put all of your vineyards under one license. Otherwise, it's going to cost you over hundred grand a year, um, which you know we're not going to do. <laughs> um, and because we work with a couple of growers that we've worked with for decades, um, who wouldn't farm organically. I mean, they farm using pretty good practices, but we would have to lose access to that fruit. So one, we need to increase our vineyard area to make sure that we can, you know, cover all of our uh, all of our requirements. Um, and then we need to be able to have everything under the same license so that it doesn't become a bureaucratic nightmare and a, and a cost prohibitive exercise. Um, so the, um, yeah, it's just something that again, long-term, you know, you don't try to, Maybe I'm. Maybe it's a cop out. Maybe I should be clicking my fingers and making it happen tomorrow. But uh, we sort of we know what we're trying to achieve, and I guess from our point of view, we're not doing it for for any marketing benefit. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do, and you should be taking that position of leadership. Um, and um, and I also don't want to be out there saying that we farm organically if we're not certified, because it's not fair to those people that that are, even if we, you know. Um, adhere to organic principles so um look it's necessarily going to be a bit of extra bureaucracy and a bit of a pain in the ass you know from a paperwork point of view but you know that that's fine we're just sort of weaning ourselves onto it slowly and but we want to do it properly so that all of our wines can all be organic but it's not a you don't have to remove this batch and that vineyard and all that sort of crap so um yeah work in progress okay I do have just a few more questions to ask you before I let you go. You've both been extremely patient with me. I appreciate it. Uh, next question, your, your, your wine market. So what, what's that looking like at the moment? What sort of impact did COVID have on you? Are the geopolitical events, the China debacle? So how are you guys going, um, taking all <laughs> things into account? You know, I went, you know, I think, I think back to April 2020 and there was a few sleepless nights thinking, God, what's what's going to happen? But um, two years on, um, all in all, things are pretty buoyant. Um, and um, the um, our channel mix has probably changed a bit. Obviously, on premise, so the restaurant trade has obviously tanked, um, and but the retail segment um, has obviously grown um, substantially, um, as has our online. And we're very grateful that we had that we'd been selling wine direct to consumers for 50 years. So we have a database, we have an established a direct contact with our customers. Um, and so we could communicate to them like we normally do and just be a little bit more diligent and tailored in, in our approach. Um, so look, all in all, um, you know, the the kind of the, the way that the sales, the channel mix is sort of changed around a bit but the net result is actually being positive um which i wish i'd known you know two years ago that i just sort of didn't have to worry about that because you know you start thinking about all sorts of crazy scenarios and um and then you know you sort of to throw in the loss of the biggest export market that we've ever had um in the middle um kind of overnight it's not like post gfc where you know the uk and the us markets sort of went like this over a few years this was flip switch you know lost what was it 1.1 billion or whatever um export for us has never been a huge part of our business it might be 15 percent. china was our biggest export market but um thankfully the year before i'd started engaging with south korea and um and they basically as china went down south korea came up and and took the slack so i okay. got a net result was um was uh, was uh, about on par. So, and other export markets were relatively buoyant. So, um, but yeah, look, having a, I think the thing is that I'd always looked at our sales strategy as being very inefficient in that we sell a small amount of wine to a lot of different people. Um, and, um, but actually, you know, that's been the best place to be <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, if you're an Australian wine business that, experienced phenomenal growth in the last 10 years it's very likely that that was to one particular market and um if all your eggs were in one basket then that was that would have been pretty tough so um no, typically um across the board it's been uh not without its moments but um yeah sitting here a couple of years later and, and things look relatively 
relatively buoyant so much so that we've sold out of a lot of wine and um and uh, yeah just waiting for new vintages to hit yeah, and i guess we um you know that's why we have always had that approach of sort of a slightly more just slow organic growth over the last you know 50 years um but that's also where you know the brand Coriel, i think has you know has good good stead in in australia and people trust it and know it and so you know you can you can sort of be relied on i guess over the last couple of years um when things were a bit more turbulent people were kind of also our customers were you know happy to support and you know i guess we, we've appreciated that too mm-hmm. you guys make great wines we drink them the cycle continues. <laughs> how good is that, that? <laughs> <laughs> gotta love it uh final two questions for each of you gentlemen um and i ask these two questions to I think just about everybody who I'm lucky enough to get on the show. Uh, first one being, uh, actually, I'll kind of merge two questions. Very special wine-related moments, um, either just a general moment that you've had into the, the context of your your wine pathway, your career, or something really special that you've drunk, uh, or a special occasion that you can reflect on and go, that was kind of awesome and may, maybe this kind of just like a side note um sheds light on how funny people outside the industry are now we look in the industry and be like oh look at how romantic is wine and you guys are sitting there going what an idiot did he actually just ask me that question but i've asked it so you guys have to answer it um, sure uh yeah look it's always difficult and sometimes it's just about certain memories um look off the top of my head at the moment there would be a few but i'll probably say at the moment um what comes to mind is probably traveling with some friends um starting our wine journey we'd kind of finished uni and got in a got in a car and we're heading across italy and i think one of our first stops was you know tasting in barolo and just had this amazing experience and i was you know probably pretty wide-eyed and kind of you know keen to get in there and see wineries and sort of the the hospitality we found um through these barolo producers taking in kind of you know probably three young aussies sort of in board shorts and you know trying to or maybe trying to like put a button shirt on to fit in um be having these amazing tastings but then i just i do remember kind of after tasting it sort of vira and then going to a uh a campground nearby in the hills of Barolo and in the summer and you know having probably eating spaghetti out of a can um but drinking some amazing Barolos that we'd had from you know tasted that day and you know sort of Domenico Clerico or Elio Tare had you know a couple of great Barolos opened um so we had great glassware we had great wine we had pretty crap food but um you know we were sort of some young young wine students sort of starting our journey and you know we we thought yeah it's it's pretty good life's pretty good so it definitely sticks in my mind um yeah that experience for sure hard to top that good luck peter <laughs> trying to think i was <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a story that we did for for not so much a not as romantic, but we um, it was must have been six or seven, maybe five, six years ago. Duncan turned thirty, and we was it thirty? I guess it was thirty. And um, so we all went to France, uh, our whole family, and our family is quite big. And um, and we had a, got a house in the Languedoc, and um, and so we we're there for two weeks. But I thought that one night I would on his birthday night I would um, curate, curate the wines for the evening. And I was thinking about different themes and trying to work out what I should, you know, how I could sort of frame something that was going to be interesting. And um, anyway, so over about a year, I collected. So I think at that point, Duncan had worked at 10 or 12 different wineries. So maybe from 2006 to 2017 or whenever we went. And um, and I remembered the, 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 the wineries that he had worked at and then, the vintage that he had worked at that winery and then, and this is all around the world. And so track down a bottle of wine from that vintage, from that winery, and then tried to remember from old emails and letters and whatever 
the particular wine that he had liked from that from that winery and vintage. So it was a really eclectic mix of wines, and it took fucking like it took a year to track all these different wines down. And because um, you always want a theme for a wine dinner, but this theme it was like nobody is ever going to get this <laughs> theme. So the dinner started, and we started with a must have been a Joseph Cromie sparkling from Tasmania. All the wines are served blind, and um, a Joseph Cromie from sparkling from Tasmania. Then we must have had a. I can't remember a, a German Riesling and and then maybe a Logan Chardonnay or whatever it was and I went on and on and on so and we went from you know sparkling light medium bodied into reds and whatever and um, anyway so we got to the end but throughout the course of the evening it was great because I remember no it was a Logan Riesling that I remember Duncan being so proud of of making this wine. And then in this tasting, just ripping it to shreds. And saying, what, a, what an awful wine. It's terrible. And um, we got to some wine that he'd made in, I don't know, maybe in Chateau Neuf or something. Oh, it's lean, it's miserable, this piece of crap, you know. Blah, blah, blah. And um, and then really rating some kind of pretty average wine that he'd made in Germany or something, <laughs> saying it was a Grand Cru Burgundy and all this sort of stuff. And my dad and my uncle and everybody putting in their kind of two cents worth because it was the most obscure thing you could imagine. And then that great reveal after the evening, revealing all of the wines. And because um, I obviously had to, everyone had to try to guess what the theme was, but nobody could get it. So, yeah, that was a really fun evening. Took a long time to put it together. But, yeah, that's great. All of the stories and the history that you can put into a meal uh, makes that meal so much richer than it, than it would have been otherwise. Wow. Yeah, it was, um, you know, there weren't like the most expensive wines um, in the world, but it was a pretty memorable experience. I think all of our family will always talk about and remember. So I guess that's a good, you know, <laughs> good lesson for what, you know, what wine can be and should be about as well what a brother did you say thank you yeah yeah no no, no. Sure has. <laughs> i'm just waiting for my four years next year <laughs> yeah better start collecting yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. we've got more money now than we did a decade ago yeah that's right <laughs> Imagine the the just money. destroy destroy whatever confidence peter has in his <laughs> wine tasting ability just yeah. make sure he doesn't get a single one of them. Mission complete. Yeah. You better yeah. start working on that. I think that was a subtle reminder to me. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, take it, Duncan. <laughs> uh, fi- final question. Okay, so wine, the advice for people embarking on or trying to enhance their own wine journey. And this is coming from, you know, two people who have grown up in the wine industry, part of a, a wine family. You know, you kind of, I'm sure if somebody was to prick you with a pen or something, you'd probably bleed McLaren Dale Shiraz or something like that. So not sure, it, you know, you're the fairest people to be asking this question as it's kind of just in, ingrained in your DNA. But yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of... Um, I think that you, you know, taste widely and, and take your time. Like, don't rush it. You know, I did my um, WSET diploma and I remember thinking I could do this in, I don't know, a year or two years or whatever, but I said, no, it shall take four. And so for my honeymoon, we spent four months in Europe visiting every single wine region that we could. And Pretty um, bloody hard, the old diploma. Well, yeah, but why make it hard? Why don't you just enjoy it, you know, and and taste widely and give you, like, don't rush it. You know, we're so used to rushing things and getting through a degree and getting through studying this. But something like wine, just um, just absolutely take your time and um, travel as widely as your finances allow you to, uh, taste as widely as your finances allow you to, and probably, the, I don't know, and if, 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 if none of that's an option just join tasting groups start tasting groups you know you just the access the you know and i think about a lot of the studies that i did and and most of the learning really happened in tasting groups with other people um so that's um that's really um yeah the advice that i would give um which is um yeah it's, I, I feel has worked well for me love it and if you can't join tasting groups uh start drinking by yourself and just yeah well at least you cry, cry out for help if you need to <laughs> 
yeah, but you know, there's there's lots of great, you know, getting like and that and if you study, like if you study WSET or whatever it is you're going to do, um, you know, there's so many passionate people there, and it can be a bit awkward because you've got to kind of say, hey, do you want to be my tasting buddy? And you know, like it's, um, but um, you know, and that might you might not really even have that much in common, but for an hour each week or whatever, you share, you know, um, conversation and tasting. So um, yeah, that's my strong advice. Love it, Duncan. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. I think it's, um, yeah, I always just encourage people to, you know, not be, you know, not be worried about, you know, if it's expensive wine or a cheap wine or just if you can, if you're really, you know, into it, just take the time when you taste what you can and and just every time you taste the wine, just stop and just have a think about is does it remind you of something, you know, is there... Is there something you don't like about it? Can you, you know, can you put any identifying features of what what is you don't like? You know, just just take that take that extra kind of ten or fifteen seconds just to really think about, you know, what you can see. However you want to describe it um, doesn't really matter. Um, you just sort of got to start somewhere, and because once you start to get an idea of your own palate, then once you then once you're talking to other people that might have a you know, a more experienced palate, you can start to pick up more from them um, about what they're talking about when they're, you know, when they're tasting wines, but you sort of need to have a, a little bit of understanding of your own palate first. So, um, but yeah, it's, it, it just takes time. Mm-hmm. Great advice guys. I was, I was just about to let you go, but then I remembered a question that I forgot to ask you earlier. So I've, I've got to ask it now. Coriol. What does that mean? What, what, where, where, does, where does that come from? What is Coriol? No one knows. It's a mystery. No knows. It's a great name. Very. Yeah. Looks a, lot great. Of think, a lot of people think our last name is Coriol. Well, that's what I was, I was thinking. I thought, Lloyd, that's not, yeah. it's yeah. like Coriol. quite as romantic, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no one knows. It's a big mystery and it'll continue to be a mystery for centuries to come. Yeah. And is it, is it Coriol or Coriol? No, it's Coriol. It's Coriol. Yeah, Coriol. Mate. Coriol. Yeah, could be Coriol, eh? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. No one knows. Yeah, yeah. So, no, there's no, um, there's no, uh, there's various kind of options offered, but no, we, we prefer to say that it, when nobody knows and, and no one ever will know. So mm-hmm. keep the mystery alive. Yeah. Love it. All right. Duncan and Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure. Can't thank you enough for your time great to know that i can get you know you both in the the same conference together and you can behave like adults and give so much to um you know my my humble little production here really appreciate it it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and i've got a few bottles of your your wonderful stuff out on the shelf that i'm really looking forward to knocking over in the short to short uh, future so thank you for your time thanks mate lovely to meet you and all the best likewise no at all a pleasure cheers, cheers. Thank you.